hi everyone. I'm uh, Kimia. I'm recently graduated uh, uh, from University of Toronto, finishing my master's under uh, supervision of Von Betts. Um, and um, today I will be presenting the work of uh, my thesis, which was focused on um, providing um, an architecture capture of a realistic device that can be used as a valuable test case for uh, open source CAD flows. Um, so um, open source CAD tools, uh, especially uh, the ones that are architecture agnostic have always been valuable uh, for the research community because they allow um, to evaluate um, the quality of different CAD algorithms and they also enable um, um, architecture exploration. Um, and so VTR, uh, very locked routing is an example of such an open source flow. Um, so uh, the VTR flow takes as input um, an um, HDL design um, and uh, the architecture, the description of the target architecture um, in XML format and um, compiles the design onto the target device and provides um, the uh, some uh, reports um, in terms of um, area, timing, and speed results. And it um, consists of three main stages, uh, starting with Odin 2 that performs logic synthesis, followed by ABC that does optimization and technology mapping. Um, and finally, um, VPR for doing uh, packing, placement, and routing. Um, and um, so, um, oh, for it's for a open source uh, flow like BPR, it's important to have a um, cap architecture um, capture of a realistic device um, provided to the users as it is a very detailed task and having um, a baseline architecture capture um, is useful for the users as they can build new architectural feature on top of. Uh, this uh, architecture capture can also be um, used as a test case for evaluation of different CAD algorithms that stresses the, the CAD flow. Um, and um, also during the process of capturing an architecture, one can um, identify the areas where uh, the architecture description might lack power, might need to be improved, um, or if it doesn't support certain architectural features that are available on uh, like um, real devices. Um, um, it also um, having a uh, capture of a large modern architecture allows for uh, compilation of uh, large benchmarks on the flow, uh, which also allows for better benchmarking as well. Um, so a previous related work has been Titanflow. Uh, the Titanflow uh, was proposed as a solution that allows uh, large designs to go through the VPR flow. Um, so uh, the open source synthesis tools have some limitation in terms of language coverage or support for IP cores. Um, and as a result for a large um, design written originally maybe for a commercial device to go through the flow. There needs to be big rewrites of certain parts of the code so that it becomes compatible with these open source synthesis tools and it's like a lot of effort uh, from the user um, and the, the modified benchmark might no longer be even presenting the original functionality of the design. So um, to um, work around that, um, Titan Flow uses um, Cordis uh, to perform synthesis. Um, and then uh, the Cordis will output a net list of atoms um, in VQM format, which is a format specific to Cordis. And um, Titan uh, also has a converter called VQM to Blif that converts the net list in VQM format to the Blif net list, uh, which is a format that can be processed by many open source flows, including VPR. Um, the Titan flow also comes with an architecture capture of Stratix 4 device um, that um, allows VPR to actually target a uh, Stratix 4 like device um, and uh, it um, as a realistic um, commercial device. 
Um, and it also comes with the Titan 23 benchmark suit, which is a large set of heterogeneous designs um, uh, with different application areas. And all of that provide like a tool set um, for, uh, for the user to enable like benchmarking um, and add more designs um, to be, and allow more designs to be targeted by the VPR flow. Um, so um, the one of the Titanflow's shortcoming is that it has only support for the Stratix four devices, um, which is a relatively old family of Intel FPGAs, and um, this device is not compatible with the newer release of Cortis. Um, and um, a lot of newer designs uh, that cover more recent application areas are also targeting more recent devices. And so uh, it doesn't provide support for those. Um, and so there is a need to um, have a capture of a more recent device. Um, and um, to this end, we have selected the Stratix 10 family um, um, and uh, provide an architecture capture um, of that as a more recent um, family of Intel FVGAs. Um, so um, we have, um, to summarize the contribution, we have upgraded the Titan flow so that um, it can um, actually be compatible with Stratix 10 um, uh, architecture. Um, the Titan benchmarks have been upgraded so that they can um, be uh, used for statics and agile X devices. And uh, you also have a um, VPR compatible capture of the Stratix 10 device. And uh, with these two, we we're actually able to uh, perform uh, a comparison in terms of QR between VPR and Cortis, as we are also, we are able to actually make the two flows target the same device using the same set of designs. Um, and the uh, uh, finding uh, our findings with regards to the performance comparison uh, will be presented later in the presentation. Um, so um, here is um, a list of the Titan 23 benchmarks. Um, as you can see, oh, like they're uh, large in size and heterogeneous uh, and uh, their application covers variety of areas uh, from uh, multi-core, uh, processors to um, image processing applications um, and uh, different different areas. Um, and the updated Titan 23 benchmarks that um, are compatible with Stratix and Agile X devices are soon to be released on the VTR website. Um, we also um, have uh, a more recent set of benchmarks called Titan New Benchmarks. Um, these cover more recent application areas. A lot of them are uh, deep learning accelerators. Uh, there is also a um, RISC-V processor here as well. Um, again, these benchmarks are uh, to be released uh, in uh, within the next few weeks on the VTR website. Um, so um, after... Uh, updating benchmarks. Uh, we are um, going to go walk through the process uh, that has been taken to capture uh, the architecture of the Stratix 10 device. Um, so um, in general, to capture any architecture, there are several steps that needs to be taken. Um, first, starting with the primitives. The primitives are the very like the leaf level uh, blocks uh, from the CAD's point of view that cannot be broken down any further. Um, and uh, the logic synthesis output, what the logic synthesis outputs is actually a interconnected uh, list of uh, atoms that are mapped to the primitives. Um, and um, so there is a need to actually first list all the available primitives on the device um, so the Stratix 10 primitives can be broken down to four main categories. Um, first, it's the IO and clock primitives, which are quite diverse. Um, and uh, we have um, tried to capture the ones that are more common and are all used in our um, target benchmark set. Um, then moving on to the lab, the logic block primitives. Um, so they uh, logic blocks are mainly built out of 
uh, flip flops and um, uh, uh, the lots that are also um, lot primitive that also contain hard adders within them. Um, so here is um, an example of a um, uh, flip-flop primitive described in our architecture format. Um, you have to describe the name of the primitive plus all its input ports, output ports, and the clock signal that's driving it. Um, and um, so moving on to the DSP primitives, um, DSP blocks, like DSP primitives in Stratix 10 can have many different modes. Um, so uh, these primitives both support uh, floating point and fixed point arithmetic. Um, and in a uh, floating point, there are different modes of operation, such as like multiply, accumulate, or multiply, add. Um, similarly, in fixed point, there are different operational modes, such as um, 27 by 27 multiplier and et cetera. Um, um, inside the DSP primitives, there are also different pipeline registers at every level, and the user has the ability to turn on and off those pipelines and like have different levels of pipelining. And um, so if you were to actually capture all those different primitive uh, modes, uh, it would have led to like a mode explosion. And a lot of these primitives are actually um, not that different in terms of like the timing results. So uh, what we tried to do was to try to capture the essence and like the most important primitive modes and then the remaining ones will be mapped uh, to the closest primitive available on the um, captured architecture. Um, and so for to actually describe those modes, uh, we have taken into account the operational mode of the DSP block plus uh, the state of the input and outputs, whether they're registered or combinational. Um, and again, the remaining ones will be mapped to the closest primitive available. So similarly for RAMs, they have many different um, modes of operation, uh, such as like single port, dual port, or ROM. They have different um, high, like different de depth and width configurations. Um, also, the outputs can be registered or combinational. And again, here we also try to capture uh, the the main, uh, the most uh, important cases and uh, the ones that matter the most. Um, and make a difference in terms of like timing results. Um, so um, after all the primitives are um, actually captured, uh, we have to describe how these primitives will be grouped together to form the top level blocks. Um, the top level blocks are the ones that are surrounded by the routing fabric and uh, they're connected to other top level blocks through the general routing infrastructure. Um, and um, so here is an example of the top level logic block. As you can see, there are like multiple levels of hierarchy here. Um, so these smaller blocks are called ALMs, which contain a single lot and four flip plots. And inside it, they also have some internal connectivity, which has to be described as well. Um, and then these ALMs, 10 of these ALMs will be put together to form a logic array block. These ALMs have like these carry chains kind of um, uh, running through them and um, to uh, provide support for arithmetic operations. They also are driven by the local interconnect here. So all these details um, have to be uh, captured. Um, and uh, the labs can also, in static ten can also be configured as um, memory labs to uh, actually implement memory blocks. So that's a, a whole like separate mode of the top level block that needs to be captured separately and the interconnect for that needs to be described separately. So if a block has different modes of operation, each of these modes also um, needs to be described uh, as well. Um, and so once we have um, uh, a list of all the top level blocks and their internal connectivity, we have to describe how these blocks will be put together in columns and how these columns will be put together in order to form the overall device grid. Um, as you can see, we have like columns of different block types and each column are repeating at like a certain frequency. Um, so, um, um, the, the overall, so all these 
details will form the overall um, FPGA grid. And um, once we have um, described um, the FPGA grid, we have to describe the routing fabric that's running through these um, uh, grid blocks. And um, so um, the Stratix 10 routing fabric is unique in that there are registers in uh, within the routing uh, wires, um, as you can see here. Uh, whoops. Um, and there are also registers at block inputs. Um, and um, these registers allow for retiming of the routing paths. Um, this is um, uh, unique to Stratix and architecture, and it's called the hyperflex architecture. Um, and um, the, uh, in our architecture capture, we have not modeled this registered uh, routing um, architecture uh, because VPR does not allow for registers in the uh, routing wires. Uh, and also VPR does not support retiming. So um, this is one piece of detail that has not been modeled in our architecture capture. Um, so uh, one update that we have uh, made to VPR during uh, the process of capturing uh, static extend routing uh, was adding support for an equal um, X and Y channel widths because static extend has um, like wider horizontal channel widths. Um, so before VPR didn't support routing graphs with unequal X, Y channel widths. Um, so uh, we have actually um, uh, address that limitation. Now VPR can model architectures with uh, different channel widths. Um, and um, that's actually quite common in a lot of commercial architectures. So uh, later on, um, the users are, are also able to uh, model these architectures uh, as well. Um, so um, oh, the first piece of detail that we need to have for modeling the routing architecture is um, the description of different horizontal and vertical routing wires. Um, here, as you can see, we have four different wire types in horizontal and vertical direction, and they have their own relative frequencies, which needs to be um, actually um, described in the architecture capture. Um, and then once we have uh, listed all the possible wire types, we have to describe how these different wire types are actually um, connected to each other at the switch boxes. Um, so uh, uh, during our switch box modeling, we have actually described, um, we, we have described for each wire type, what's the size of the MUX driving that wire type. Um, and also uh, what's the number of inputs driven by each wire type. Um, so here in this example, uh, we have the long um, horizontal wire, which is the H24 wires, um, and uh, they have an input max of size 50. And we know that um, like we have um, 38 inputs coming from um, other like short horizontal wire, which are H10, H4, and H2 wires. And then we have drivers from uh, long vertical wires. Um, and so while we have describe these details, we still don't know the exact wiring pattern. Um, so the, the original wiring pattern has probably been fine-tuned by um, Intel architects. And so we're expecting our um, uh, the wiring pattern created by VPR to not be as optimal. Um, while we provide some big, big picture info in terms of like connectivity inside the switch box, we don't know the exact patterns. Um, so, uh, once we have the switch box modeled, the last pieces of, uh, architecture, uh, routing architecture are the connection boxes, which are defined through the FC in and FC out values that are defined for the block input and output pins. There are also some dedicated, uh, routing resources, for example, carry chains that are running through, uh, the logic blocks, um, that like directly connects two logic blocks to each other. Um, and there is also direct connections between the, the blocks that are adjacent horizontally um, for like faster um, uh, speed connections. So um, all these uh, routing resources also are described in our target architecture. Um, and um, so once we have the 
uh, routing architecture described. Uh, we have also provided the timing details. Um, so to that end, we have developed a group of uh, tiny benchmarks and uh, then uh, run them through the Cordis and extracted the delay values from Cordis timing reports. Uh, for that, we have used a single timing corner, uh, the 100 um, Celsius uh, timing corner, which, which typically leads to the worst results. Um, and uh, to get the timing capture, uh, it, the timing capture breaks down to two different categories. It's the routing fabric, uh, which is uh, consists of the uh, routing segment uh, delay and the switch delay. Um, so with the routing fabric, we don't know the exact delay model. Cordis has access to like the physical information of every single wire. Uh, the delay for the wires can be different depending on what's driving them. Um, and so it's it's the model that Cordis runs is very detailed. Um, oh, so he, in here, instead, we're trying to kind of like average um, a delay across different um, pa uh, routing paths and kind of, while well, it's not perfect, but it it's in reasonable agreement um, with uh, the delay results uh, that we get from Cordis. Um, and so in addition to the routing fabric, we have to provide um, the timing info for the internal of the top level blocks that includes uh, the interconnect, uh, the uh, combinational delay of the primitives that are inside the blocks and uh, the register related information, again, all of which is derived from um, the Cordis timing reports. Um, so once we have an architecture capture of the strategic stand device, we're actually able to run a performance comparison between VPR and Cordis. Uh, which is more recent based off of a more recent um, commercial device. And so uh, we are running both flows with a single thread. So the runtime remains comparable. We're using the Titan 23 benchmark suit and we're using um, Cordis Prime Pro version 21.2. Um, and uh, for VPR, we're running VPR in two modes. Uh, first in auto mode, during which um, the grid size is uh, going to be determined at runtime um, based on the design size. Um, and we're also going to run VPR in fixed mode where the grid size is given beforehand and the device will not get resized during runtime. But now because we have the grid size uh, beforehand, we are able to actually pre-build some of the data structures that are dependent on the grid and feed them into the flow rather than letting VPR to build these data structures on the fly, and that will like save a considerable amount of time. Uh, these data structures include like the routing graph, the router look ahead, and the placement delay lookup. Um, and um, so to actually run VPR in fixed mode, we have provided the layouts of five different um, Intel devices uh, shown here. Uh, these five devices are in different size ranges, and each benchmark is mapped to the smallest device that can fit the design. Um, and here is just a little visual aid for what is an auto layout versus a fixed layout. On the left, um, you can see that VPR starts with a um, smaller grid and it starts packing. And uh, while it's grouping uh, primitives into blocks, it's actually uh, taking note of the device utilization. Every time the device utilization gets high, it will resize the device um, so that it can actually add more uh, blocks uh, to the device. Um, and uh, with the fixed layout, however, the, the uh, grid size is fixed and um, doesn't get resized. And so as a result, we're able to actually feed some of these data structures that has been built before uh, running the flow um, to actually save runtime. Um, and so here are the results uh, given four, First, for the auto layout mode, um, so um, the results are normalized with respect to Cordis. Um, so um, as you can see, all of the designs are going through the flow. Um, there is a considerable gap in packing. Um, part of it could be because of the fact uh, because of the fact that VPR's packer is a lot more generic uh, and is not like. Um, doesn't have any assumptions about the target architecture. So the legality checks are very generic and can take uh, a long time. 
Um, the place time is also uh, quite um, uh, like significantly larger uh, because, uh, well, it can be partly because VPR is using a simulated annealing based um, placer, uh, although it's using reinforcement learning to actually speed up the flow. Uh, but um, compared to Cordis, Cordis uses a mix of an analytical and um, a simulated annealing based placer that might take faster, like might be faster to converge. Um, the route time, however, as you can see, remains significantly smaller. Um, this can be partly due to the fact that like VPR is doing less during the routing uh, because VPR is routing only the connections between the top level blocks. Uh, the paths that are within the top level blocks are already routed during the packing stage. Uh, so it's also a matter of like these different stages are not exactly doing the same amount of work uh, when we're comparing VPR against Cordis. And so that's also part of the reason why packing is taking longer in, in VPR because it's doing more work uh, versus routing where uh, VPR is actually doing less um, uh, because Cordis is just doing like point-to-point -point routing, point-to-point -point connections from the primitive to the primitive goes all the way to the block, whereas BPR is just routing all the way like from the top level block to the top level block. Um, and so um, the total time, as you can see, is around like 30% uh, higher for um, VPR. Um, the memory usage is uh, considerably smaller and there is a, also a considerable um, QR gap. Uh, the wire length is around like 12 percent higher for VPR. It can be partially due to the fact that we're not uh, that our wiring patterns is not as fine tuned as the um, in like as the original static ten wiring patterns. Um, the frequency is around also 25 percent. Um, slower on average um, and um, that can be associated with like uh, multiple stages of the flow. Uh, well, first of all, VPR is not doing any retiming, uh, which can be a, um, which have shown to actually improve uh, the uh, frequency. Uh, there is also, uh, Cortis also does a, um, a de like detailed, placement optimization stage where it's moving around the primitives um, that have already been clustered. Uh, whereas with BPR, uh, the packing uh, solution that's been provided is going to be, is cannot be changed later by the placer. Um, so that optimization can also help to improve uh, the uh, QR results. Um, there are also like um, some uh, optimizations that are like, um, uh, tailored for the target the device that's being performed in Cordis, whereas with like more generic algorithms uh, that VPR is using, it it's not able to perform such optimizations. And finally, there might be also some gaps coming from like the uh, different stages of the flow and based on like the different CAD algorithms that are being used. That's kind of hard to pinpoint exactly how much gap they're causing because like we don't have access to the internal statistics of different stage of cortis flow. Um, so um, after um, doing comparison with the auto layout, we move on to comparing the results uh, against a VPR run with fixed layout. Um, so as you can see, um, seven of the designs are now failing. Uh, there is like, because of the routing congestion uh, that uh, VPR is not able to resolve. And in, in a few slides, I will um, go through the reason why these failures are happening. Uh, but there's also some variation here compared to the auto layout, but because this result is not taking into account uh, the benchmarks that have failed, um, it, the results were not fully comparable. Um, um, then we have also run the fixed layout um, with the pre-built data structures. The most important takeaway here is the total time, uh, which have uh, reduced significantly and is now around like 20% uh, smaller compared to Cordis, um, mostly because uh, now VPR is not spending time on building those data structures. Uh, that are related to the grid and they're quite large. 
um, because to the total time is not just the aggregation of these three stages, but also the pre-processing steps that might take time. And so now because that, that pre-processing has been become shorter, the total time has now reduced um, significantly. Um, and so to go over why um, there is um, a lot of um, routing failures for the benchmarks when they're in fixed layout, I have to first go through uh, the VPR packer flow when uh, uh, we're targeting a fixed layout. So VPR first tries to pack with the unrelated clustering turned off. Um, the unrelated clustering is a um, feature that allows um, the um, like the the atoms that are not uh, connected uh, to be packed together here. As you can see, for example, this um, cluster, these atoms are not connected to these atoms. And so because unrelated clustering is turned off, uh, they're not going to be grouped with each other and they're going to be packed in separate blocks. And so this will result in a uh, sparser packing solution, but it will uh, it can help with the quality of results by uh, leading to less routing congestion um, and um, also allowing like um, highly connected nets to be actually contained within a block. Um, so it first tries to pack with the unrelated clustering turned off. And if the design is not able to be fit on the device, it will retry again this time with the unrelated clustering turned on. Now that the unrelated clustering is turned on, VPR can, for example, pack these two um, set of um, atoms with each other, although they're not related, they're not, they don't have any strong connections. Um, and so because of that, VPR is packing more densely. And so it might be able to actually fit uh, the design on target device the second time. And so if it's still not able to fit the, design, it will return failure. Otherwise, the packing will be done. And so um, so what happens during um, um, the use of fixed layout is that a lot of these designs are IO dense. And because IOs are generally not uh, strongly connected to each other, at the first stage, they will be packed sparsely and VPR will run out of IO resources. So it will enter the second round where, where it tries to pack uh, stuff with unrelated clustering turned on. However, it's not smart enough to only turn unrelated clustering on for IO blocks. And it turns on the unrelated clustering for all the blocks. So now like all logic blocks, RAMs and all those stuff will be packed a lot more densely, although that's not necessary because there were enough resources to accommodate those before. And it was just the IOs that were running out of resources. So as a solution, uh, and so because everything was being packed a lot more densely, there was a considerable amount of routing congestion that the router was not able to resolve and resulted in failure. And to resolve that, um, we have uh, uh, updated VPR so that the unrelated clustering feature is now being controlled by block type. After the first round, um, if the design is not cannot fit the device, uh, VPR will only turn on unrelated clustering for the block types whose utilization is exceeding one. Um, and so with the updated VPR, we reran the flow, uh, the two flows, and here are the results. So now um, all the designs are going through VPR um, and there are no failures. Um, so the total time is still remaining smaller compared to Cordis. Um, the wire length and frequency have also improved slightly. And um, the final uh, state is that there is like around 10% gap in wire length and 15, 16% gap in frequency. Um, and um, so to sum up, uh, we have uh, provided um, a um, architecture capture of static stem that's compatible with VPR and can be used alongside the Titan flow. Um, all the different parts of the Titan flow along with the Titan benchmarks have been updated um, in order to um, add support for the new um, Intel device families uh, with the benchmark that included um, kind of remapping of the um, IP cores in the old device to the available IP cores on the new device and also uh, comparing the results of um, benchmarks on the new device with the old to make sure that with the old device to make sure that actually all the results um, are 
uh, making sense and there is no big gaps in resource count or uh, frequency. Um, and, um, and also, um, once we have the up updated Titanflow, uh, we were able to run a performance comparison between VPR and Cordis. The results indicate that there is a considerable uh, gap in uh, packing time and placement time. Um, however, the overall runtime remains um, smaller compared to Cordis when using fixed layout with the pre-built data and the memory usage also significantly smaller. Um, the quality of results, there is still a, a considerable gap around 10% gap in viral length and 16% gap in frequency. Um, and so um, based on our, the results of our performance comparison, some of the future directions uh, for um, the VPR can be like making improvements to uh, make the gap uh, in runtime and QR smaller. Uh, so the packing runtime can be improved more specifically while still keeping its generality. Um, so in our find, in our um, actually when we were making the comparison, we were trying to find a reason. Uh, we figured that packing, well, because VPR uh, has two legality checker. The first one is approximate, but it's fast. The second one is exact, but it takes much longer. We found out that the approximate. Uh, legality checker is actually over optimistic. And so a lot of times it's not able to detect Ill illegal cases that will be passed on to the exact legality checker to be uh, to detect those cases that takes much longer so that approximate legality checker can become um, a little more uh, smarter um, to um, to actually uh, improve the packing runtime. Um, there is also more investigation to be done. Uh, to figure out the causes for the uh, runtime gap in placement. Um, and um, also one important optimization stage that we have found out for Cordis to actually help with the QR results uh, was actually allowing Placer to re-optimize the packing solution uh, by moving primitives around uh, and uh, repacking uh, some primitives. Um, and this is a work that's that is in progress right now uh, by Vaughn's group. And um, also adding support for um, flat routing. Um, so currently routing VPR is like, v the routing VPR is happening in two stages. One is happening during packing, which is routing the connections inside the top level blocks. And the second routing stage is where it's trying to route the connections between the top level blocks. And so that will cause some limitation when we want to capture like complex local interconnect and uh, partial crossbars. So uh, by having a single stage routing, uh, those limitations can be addressed. And this is also an effort that's in progress. Um, and um, so now that we have the capture of a more recent device, more uh, recent benchmarks with more recent application areas can be added um to uh, the benchmark suit um and also there can be several enhancements made to the architecture description uh well first of all uh, the primitives can become parameterized um to allow for a uh, shortening the description right now every parameter um that uh, like every primitive that um is like representing a different mode of uh, the same block is have to be described separately with parameterizing the primitives that this can this description can become shorter. Um, and also the interconnect description can be improved to um, make the description shorter. Um, and um, also uh, we have realized that uh, in a lot of modern architectures, uh, there might be a mix of unidirectional and bidirectional routing, for example, while unidirectional is still the dominant routing architecture. Um, there are a lot of times for the longer wires, um, uh, they might be bidirectional um, and they can be driven in multiple places. Um, and so um, allowing uh, VPR to actually uh, capture those architectures um, can be valuable and allow for better, uh, just like more accurate um, capture of uh, realistic devices. Um, so uh, that was all. Um, thanks, everyone, for listening, and I would be happy to answer any questions.